Welcome to Game Changers Live from Miami, Florida. My name is Sergio Tijera. I'm your host. And each and every week, we bring you someone who has been a game changer in their field and who's touched the lives of thousands to get their perspective on their journey, their mindset, their struggles and successes so that we can inspire you on your journey. So let's get started right now. And welcome to Game Changers Live, coming to you from the beautiful campus, Florida International University, the College of Communications, Architecture, and the Arts. This is our home studio here in beautiful Miami, Florida. Thank you for supporting Game Changers. We're now a number two ranked podcast globally by Listen Note. So thank you so much for your support. And if you enjoy what you hear on these episodes and it inspires you, be sure to subscribe and like. So my guest today is Alejandra Estefania. And she's a painter, poet, and storyteller. We met recently, and some of her work is so inspiring. We had to have her here on the show. Uh, she's worked with brands such as Nike. She's been featured on Forbes, NBC, and a number of other areas. And she's working on a tremendous project, which is it's very, very important, especially in today's uh, world, called the American Passport. It really talks about cultural diversity and the stories that a lot of the immigrants have been through. And it's a really important topic because then she's able to to express herself and her paintings to to depict and to communicate what people are going through in the struggle. So welcome, Alejandra. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. That was quite an intro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you deserve it. You deserve it. So tell me a little bit about your story. You know, right now you've been you've been doing some amazing work, but it doesn't always start off that way, right? right. So Give, give me a bit of your background. How Kind of like the beginning, the beginning, or just an overall... <laughs> Where were you born exactly? And okay. then what happened in your first few minutes? No, just kidding. Okay. Uh, no, but I'm originally from Ecuador, so I was born there. And then we came to the States with my mom and my brother when I was four. Um, and I was raised in North Carolina. I didn't discover art or anything until I was about 20. And once I discovered it, I packed up everything. I applied to art school in Miami and I came here in the pursuit of my dreams as an artist. So what was like uh, life like in North Carolina for, for a Hispanic <laughs> girl from, uh, you know, for, for, from Latin America? Because, you know, being here in Miami, it's a very cultural diverse place. Mm -hmm. it, you know, everyone speaks different languages. It's very common, right? but it wasn't necessarily that way, you know, perhaps for you in in, right. in North Carolina, different areas there in the South. It was a little Tell me about that. Miami. It was yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Honestly, it was it was an interesting thing, like especially because when we first came, we moved to like a really tiny town, like one road in, one road out. It was the country. There was like one restaurant, one church. So we were like everybody was so country. And but the like a small church took us in that was really great. And like the day that we came to the church, like the pastor put us on stage and he was like, they're not from here. We're going to love them like they're our own and like <laughs> took us all the way in. And so like that was cool, but it wasn't you felt like you were different. You know, like we didn't I didn't I learned how to speak English once like I came here. So it was very different. And it was like even my name, I couldn't say Alejandra because no one would say it going by Ali for most of my life until mm. I came to Miami. And so how did you guys end up in North Carolina in a small town of all the places? So my mom brought us to the States. The only person she knew in this country was her sister who was living right there, lived on top of the mountain in North Carolina. Wow. And so because she had married uh, someone from there. And so that was the only like kind of safe haven, which is so crazy because especially like once we get into American passport, like we I think about these things of just like kind of it's almost like the system of like connections of how we end up in certain places like that was who she knew so mm -hmm. that's who that's where we came like there is no option it's kind of like well where are you going to be <clears throat> safe and and in a good environment so that was just having to be ours so that's interesting because it reminds me of my parents when they came from cuba they ended up going on a church program to to springfield massachusetts of all places right, right. because that's where they got their you know their landing and so forth they got mm -hmm. their their set up there but you know for a lot of hispanics a lot of latinos coming in from you know, from other countries, either escaping communism or some, you know, looking for a better life, you don't often get the chance to decide where you're going to, where you're going to go. Right. But right. you think, Hey, it's got to be better than where I'm at now. Right. Get your start. And, but you get to North Carolina, you're, you know, you got welcome to the church program. Was it all roses? No. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about Absolutely that. Not. I mean, I think, you know, like every people, like every person has their own stories. And I think, Hours and the way that I grew up was just very distinct and kind of purposeful for me. And so, like, we you know it was not all roses. Like, there was a lot of ups and downs. My mom was a single mother. 
you know, like a Latina immigrant. She was educated in, in Ecuador. But, you know, once you come here, like it doesn't really matter. You got to redo. So like right. we were joining my mom. I remember we used to sit outside her like college classrooms because she would take college classes at night. Sometimes we'd sit outside and like wait for her. And like she would watch us from the window because we didn't have any bait sitters or anything like that. So like it was just a very interesting like girl quickly. Like yeah. we were very aware. And so there was just like my mom's struggles of like kind of doing it but she's such a badass like she always figured it out and so there's it's just I think a lot of like interpersonal things that happened um that affected my brother and I within the family unit but ultimately what I watched was my mom come here with nothing and give us basically the opportunity to become anything that we wanted yeah. and so I just witnessed it firsthand and like watch how she like made it happen i i don't know it still kind of blows my mind sometimes when i think about it yeah i mean as, as a single mom you don't have much of a choice you gotta you gotta work hard you gotta work you know day and night and you gotta raise kids that's not easy especially in a, in a foreign country now right. you, you perhaps you don't speak the language well right did did you pick up english quickly yeah or? so it was actually the pastor's wife who taught me english oh, that's okay. why sometimes like when i say certain things there's like a certain twang that might come yeah, out. yeah 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 i heard <laughs> it like i, I learned it. it there so um no nah, i did i learned pretty quickly my mom's a brilliant woman so she speaks like six languages really so she can and she's a spanish professor now but my mom made sure we couldn't speak english to her we could only speak spanish because she didn't want us to lose it which thank god she right. did that super important and in the house it was very much like ecuadorian like it was like very typical in the house but as soon as we exited it was like very american and like and i we would even change a little bit to adjust to the formality of that culture what other languages does she speak she speaks a spanish english french italian sign language i think that's it wow yeah Nice, so nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So then, mm -hmm. around twenty years old or so, you guys decide to move to Miami. Why? Why did you move? Why did you decide to move? What? What happened there? Well, she, they didn't. I I moved oh, out of my mom's house okay. when I was seventeen in North Carolina. And given there's like a lot of there's more. I think if you know we were going there, I think there's a lot more stories that I could bring to service. But like to sum it up, I just was not in a good place. Like I was 17, I was on my own. When I left, my mom was like, if you're out, you're out. Don't mm. come for me for anything. I'm not gonna help you. So I've been financially independent since I was 17. And so I very much had to like figure it out on my own. And so once I discovered art, I kind of had like a surrender moment. Um, I had been just kind of like hitting brick walls and like internally and externally and trying to find myself, I just was just lost. And I just had the breakdown moment one day because I was so hungry. I was like tired of starving and yeah. I was tired of like just, oh man, it was just tough. And so I just like called out for God to give me a purpose. And so when I did that, within a few days, I heard very clearly go paint. And so that's what I did. And so once I started, it was like I couldn't, my hands were like, it, like wow. I, 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 my whole body like transformed in that moment. Like I just found it. And so once I found it, I dedicated myself <clears> to it. And then, so I came to Miami alone. So hold on. So, so you were on your own, mm -hmm. you know, kind of living wherever you, you can find a place right. to sleep and right. eating wherever you can. Right. And were, were <laughs> working? cans of rice. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> so were I you working that. or, or did yeah, you, you know, like, like sell could, your paintings? No, not absolutely not. Cause I wasn't, I like, I it, it, like, imagine like if you were like to decide like tomorrow you won't play baseball professionally. You know, you're going to pick up the ball. You don't know what to do. You're going to learn. Right. So like I was just learning and I was just applying. And the thing is, I was addicted to it because what was happening, I was creating was like, I felt like all those things that I kept buried inside of like of because of my life, like mm. just started pouring out. And so it became therapeutic for me. And then also became very distinct that like, that's what I wanted to do with my life. So like when I uh. called my mom and I was like, because I had um, originally thought about going to college for law um maybe practice like something in there and so my mom had like that vision of me and she's very into education and so right. when i called her and i was like oh yeah mommy like <laughs> i was like oh yeah mommy i was like um guess what I i'm gonna be this, an artist right i'm gonna be an artist <laughs> like, what are you talking and, about like, and it's my purpose in life and you can't stop me and i'm gonna do this and she was like kid like what are you talking about yeah and i tried to tell her and she couldn't understand and i think that's also a testament to sometimes even the people closest to you won't ever understand like what you feel or your vision for something right. so like and that's okay you get a lot of detractors of people that want the best for you but right. they want what you what they think right. is best for you and not necessarily exactly. what you think is best for you exactly so I think, 
so did you know that you were that talented or I mean, you know, I wasn't. I, though. I kind of figure it out very quickly that I can only draw stick figures, okay. and my brother got all the all the artistic talent in 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 the gene pool. Okay. So, <laughs> did you know that? I think. I mean, I was always creative. Like, I was always a writer. I think those things, those like little towns, came out later in my career or have started to blossom out. But painting, absolutely not. Like, I had no talent. Like, it wasn't. I had a delusional confidence. Like, I couldn't see that I wasn't good. All I could see was that I loved it, and that through loving it eventually i would become great at it right if i just kept giving it attention and practice so like i couldn't see how bad it was and like what's funny because oh. like my mom has like those <clears throat> first pieces i ever made and she has them all over her house and it's so embarrassing every single time i go because i'm like yo what was i thinking no wonder <laughs> she was like what do you mean you're gonna, like, I'm gonna hold on to these yeah. guys so you can re realize what i saw <laughs> right, right, exactly you she know? was like girl what are you doing like no this is not good oh my but God. i couldn't see it i all i felt all i could see was what i felt you right know? Like, so i was blinded by it so thank god i didn't get like even when i came to art school in miami like everyone was so talented because they had been doing it their whole life mm. and so i was just catching like, up to do oh my god complete yeah yeah so right. it's so it's interesting. We were just talking about that. That when, when we first started this podcast, it was you know out of my home office from from the laptop, no mics, no computer, you know, no no cameras, no nothing. And you think, oh man, this is awesome. You know, look, look what I produced. Right. But now you look back at that and you're like, wow, that was kind of garbage. <laughs> but <laughs> but you you know it's so it's important that you find something you're passionate about. You work on the craft. You show up, and every day or every time you do it, you're going to get one better, right? You're one percent, one percent, right? After a year, you know, 365% better versus where you were last year. Nice. And so, mm -hmm. you know, talk to me about how you show up to yourself every day and like how you show up your, to your painting. I, I've seen and, and heard people talk about, you know, artists say, okay, I only paint when I'm, when I'm inspired. Mm -hmm. But there is uh, also something to say about discipline and saying, you know, right. yeah, I, 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 I show up and I, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired at 9 a.m. every morning because that's when I'm, you know, when, when I show up to do this. Right. How does it work for you? I practice. Like, I'm not concerned about the yeah. final product. I'm cons my focus is on just like your tweaking, process, tweaking and the process and enjoying that part. And like, mm. like you said, just chipping away and getting better. Like, do I enjoy t making something, seeing it's not perfect, coming back to it, tweaking until I'm finally looking at it and feeling like that feels complete. Right. And so like, I practice so that when the inspiration hits, I have the technical skills to bring to life what I see in my mind. Uh, because that's the thing. It's like, how do you connect what you see in your head versus what you're able to produce by hand? Like, that's a whole process, mm, right? Like, just because I can, yeah, yeah. You can it visualize it, but here. how do you deliver yeah, it yeah. Like, in oh, person? It's so good in my mind, but then I go to do it and it's a stick figure. Well, that ain't it. Yeah. So yeah. like, well, how do I develop that figure, right? And how do I like put it into a context that we're like, you're not distracted by how poorly it's done. Cause that's an annoyance for me. Like I never like to look at things and be annoyed by the fact that it was done lazily. Right. Like I, I like to see something and feel like, damn, that was really well done. Like, wow, I didn't miss a spot. Like right, I really right. took my time with it. And so like, I'm, and it's not about perfection, but no, in, in your process it. is what inspires you, right? And kind of getting that little corner right or uh, the edge of an eye or whatever, right. a nose or something or an too, expression. It's like, it's like art is interesting. Like you have to approach it really vulnerably. Like sometimes you're afraid of what you're going to make. Sometimes you mm. don't even want to make something because you, you don't, you're like, damn, is it even going to be good? So I don't, when I approach anything, I don't think about like how I'm going to benefit. I think about how do I make this to the point where it's so good that the people have to receive the message yeah. because it's so obvious and it's so right there for you to feel it and intake it. And that, that type of thinking applies to any, any, any industry, any kind of, you know, if you're in leadership or if you're in sales, whatever you do. Um, you can take those those same principles and apply it for for success, right? Because a lot of what holds us back is our ego and our, like you said, being vulnerable to you know getting a no, getting right. a thousand no's, and right. it's not about the the no. It's hey, how can I tweak my sales message a little bit because you're focused on you know perfecting that that piece, right. and eventually things will take care of themselves because, like you said, it it speaks directly to everybody. It's obvious to everybody when they see it, right. and like wow, I get it. 
Right. And that's honestly, like to that point, it's like that's why like the nose, the closed doors, the like the no money until there is money. Like, you know, like that whole process to me is so fascinating because and this is why I think it's so important that like you really have to know who you are. You have to know what you love. And like because that's the thing. How do you get past that? Well, like, are you doing it? Do you want the yes? Are you doing it because you want the money? Are you doing right. it because you want the fame? If you're going to do it for those reasons and you're going to continually get stopped along the way in ways that halt you because it's an ego game. Yeah. But if you're doing it, it's just an approval game. Right, right. If you're doing it just because you love it so much, the nose won't phase you because you're not doing it for that. You're not doing it for the approval of like what anybody has to say about it. You're doing it just because you want to be doing it. Mm -hmm. Point period and that's liberating of it's course, super liberating because you're yeah. not relying on anyone else's opinion about what they think and you know they're getting right. their approval and that's like the ultimate risk too i think too because it's like okay well now i'm risking not doing something because somebody else is going to give me something for it but i'm just going to like authentically create my entire world to the way that I want to do that. It's like, well, I'm going to make it because I just feel like I need to make this. And like by chance, someone sees it and feels it. And then all of a sudden now it's a win that I didn't even see coming, that I wasn't even anticipating because that's not why I did it. I did it because I just needed to do it for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I move in, in my world is like, I just do what feels right for me. And when did you, I, when did you figure out that you know, painting around cultural stories and diversity and things like that, that that was your thing, that that was your groove. You know, it's so funny. I have no idea when that happened. Like the first thing I ever really did, well, the first thing I painted was like a sunset, then it was like clouds. And then I painted or I drew a portrait of like this like Afghan boy. And that was like the first thing I like portrait. And then the first painting I ever did was like Biggie. I oh did, yeah. yeah hell yeah I did, I did portrait of biggie it was so funny because like it's actually all right it's not too shabby i see yeah, and i'm yeah, like yeah. okay girl i see you like it wasn't too off base um yeah so i don't know i think i think it's just something that happened naturally because like when i approach the canvas i'm never really like too i'm not overthinking it i'm just more like allowing myself to be guided right so a lot of times like i'll meditate before i'll light up before and i'll like pace and i'll dance and i'll move and then like i'll get the energy source and then i'll just start like start moving my hands and so like and sometimes it just comes to be and i think people just started coming to be through my work because that's because i wanted to help people with my work and so I think that naturally just became the subject matter. And I love people. Like, I love hearing stories. I love underdogs. I love people who have, like, just been through so many things and overcome it. I like heroes. I like these tales. And so I think that's just inevitably what started happening through work is that I just started painting people who I saw as heroes. It was just, like, kind of like an instinct. So you come to Miami. Mm -hmm. You're like, what's your first impression? I'm so glad I'm not from Miami because I wasn't used to it. So everything was shocking. And I just saw so many opportunities to like do something. And like, especially because I was like backed by this like crazy purpose too of like, ah, I'm going to do, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to be honest. Hungry. And, like, I was hungry, like starving, like literally. And, yes. and like, in all literally, the ways, figuratively, like, in both. All the ways, in all the ways. And so I was just hungry and I, and I was, and I was eager to persist. Like I was so ready to go. And so I came to school and like everyone was doing the thing. And I was almost never in school because like I was working two jobs um, and I was going to school. And so like I was never in class. I would pop in, listen, do what I had to do. And then I'd pop out to like get to my job. Mm -hmm. And so like um, I was also listening to so many podcasts and reading so many books about how to be an entrepreneur because I didn't want to go the traditional gallery route. I didn't want to have to like give away the rights to my work and my images. Like I started thinking about mm, these things very as early a business. on. Hell yeah. yeah. And so like I started listening to that. And so by the time it was like my <laughs> final year in college, I was already selling out of my pieces. And so I prepared myself to succeed as an independent artist. Mm. And so then that to me is like part of the practice too. It's not just picking up the brush, but it's educating myself so that I'm ready to go. Like no matter what the situation is. And even if I don't and I'm not ready, like I know where to find the resources and the tools to get better. Right. And so I was just kind of double like, you, you know, the artist, the artist side on and one and then the business and the, the other. And it was just like, right, well, what happens if I put that together? What, mm. what can I do? So you started working with some of the biggest brands around. How did that, how did that get started? Like did you get discovered or, re you know, somebody kind of recommended you? Or kind what? of. And this is kind of like a thing where I think is important. Like before I went full time, I was working part time in one of those like painting online places. 
And I think if you're like trying to move into a field, like it's helpful to establish yourself somewhere can kind of like lead into that segue and like, you know, multi-purpose. So I did some sort of like company painting thing with Bacardi and they mentioned to me that they were looking for artists. And this was around the time where I was planning on going full time. And so like I went through the application, I did the thing and I just kind of forgot about it. I went full time as an artist, like right after. And I actually, it was like three months into being like full time. And I was like, oh shit. Like, <laughs> so like, yeah. So let me ask you about that. Cause uh -huh. you go full time, you start getting paychecks yep. from different places. Right. And right. then it's like, all right. So right. where's, where, where's my next meal going to go? So, I got to go hunt something yeah. down, go sell something. And that's the thing as an entrepreneur is like, it's kind of the game every day, every day. That's every, every day. day, you know? So that's why you can't ever stop being right. hungry. Like you right. got, that's why you got to love what you do. Like yeah. it all ripples back. So like, um, I think this is, I trust heavily on being guided. I trust heavily on like leaning into another energy source other than just my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I lean into it. So a lot of things started to happen where I was just kind of guided and connected and the universe did its part. And I, I did my part, right? Cause like a universal hungry heart, like not a lazy one. So like I was working and the universe yes. was feeding and, but still not all the way. And I was still like, ah, and it was, or it was three months yeah. in. I don't know what I was expecting, but right. I was three months. And I like, and there's no playbook, especially to being on like an arts entrepreneur. Right. Yeah. And it was funny. Cause like I reached this moment where I was like, yo, I'm done. Like, I'm not going to do this. Like I, and I don't, I'm not a quitter. Mm -hmm. Like I don't ever really have those thoughts, but it was just one night hit me hard. And I, and I leaned the front and I was like, yo, like, I think this is it. And she was like, yeah, it's probably it. Like she was the worst friend at the time. Yeah, you're like, like yo, I, I that's not what I needed. I, was like, I needed no. somebody to say, no, hang in I there. Know. Yeah. I was like, I appreciate that. But it's funny. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was <laughs> like, I appreciate that. Support. Let me and not so, have you as my coach. Right. And so I like had that moment and she, and I went home and I was like, I guess that's it. And I was getting ready to like pack up my bags and go back to North Carolina. And the wow. next morning I called my mom and like, that's the thing. My mom did not believe that I could be an artist. Like she was mm. like my unintentionally biggest hater at the time. And so I called her and I was like, wait, mommy, I think that's it. Like, I'm gonna come home. You were right. I like, I can't do this. Oof. And she was like, no, she was like, esta no es mi hija. like, this isn't my daughter on the phone. I don't know who is calling me right now. And she's like, but you've been in much worse situations and figured it out. And she was like, so shake it off. And she was like, and call me later. And I was nice. like, oh. nice. No, like, that's like, who okay, I needed Kanji. to talk to. <laughs> I was like, okay, Kanji coming out. Hi. I was like, bet. And so that's I put awesome. my head down. I got to work. And I think within the next month, Bacardi called me and told me that they were going to sponsor me. Wow. And so it was like very like, and so I talk about that sometimes in different interviews and things because it's so important because there's so many people that are like at that moment where they want to quit. Mm -hmm. You can't, like you just got to put your head down, focus and like block that noise out. Where they say that the, the night is darkest before the dawn, right? Yep. And the the issue is that as an entrepreneur, you never know how close you are to the next, to your breakthrough. Because you can be pushing and pushing and pushing and grinding and sweating. And, and man, you're not getting, you feel like you're not getting anywhere, right? But you're like, keep believing, keep believing. And right. then it gets to the point where like, all right, is this going to happen or yeah. not? And and so many people quit right before their big breakthrough. Right. And then they never, never they never see it. And they right. always think, oh man, what if I would have just pushed a little harder? Right. You know, so one of my, my biggest fears in life is, is, is not to regret something I have done, but to regret something I haven't done. Right. And I don't right. want to be in my deathbed looking back and say, man, I wish I should have done that when I was 40 or 44 right. or whatever. And so I'm one like, you know, like you just to consistently push, mm -hmm. push, 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 you know, eventually there's, oh, there's yeah. something to say about lasting power, not only exactly. in art, but in business and everything. If you can stick around when everyone else drops off after a year or oh, two. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's like, all right, you know, still there. That's she's still there consistent. Oh yeah. And like, not just even there consistently, consistently getting better. Right. So like, it's like, w I always like, I never worry about what any other creative or artist is doing. I observe and I get inspired, but I don't even, I, to be honest with you, I don't care. Like it has nothing to do with me. I just, I focus on what I bring to the table every right. day, every time. And like, I just, that's it. So it's it's just a different level of focus, like mm, so bullseye focus, like a target. Yeah. So you start getting jobs and with different companies. Your your art your art keeps improving. And so tell me about now the American Passport Project, the, this passion project you got going on, which has a lot of value to to what's happening. A very very um, 
it, it makes sense in today's world, right? That needs to be shown. So tell me about this idea and how it came about. Well, it was actually kind of like, um, I would say it was right after I had worked with Nike. This was in 2020. So like I had just worked with Nike and I remember I had this moment <laughs> After I worked with Nike, I was like, oh, shit. I was like, how do I top this, though? Like, it's Nike. Like, yeah, yeah. like what now? Like, what am I supposed to do now? And I kind of, in a way, felt defeated because I was like, well, like, what else is there? You know, I had, like, created this company and business with my brother at the time, like, selling artwork to collectors around the world. Like, I had started working with different brands and all these different things. And so it was like, it almost being easy. Like, it almost became like, man, was that it? Like now, okay, so great. We're making money, but like now what? Like, right. like I just missed like the, like the, oh, uh, you know, like, wow, man, I just missed that a little bit. And so I remember I had that moment with Nike. I was like, man, what was next? Like, and I prayed on it and then it was hitting. It was like, well, well, God's bigger than Nike, you know, like, well, impact is bigger than that. Like, don't even focus on that. And so 2020 hit and I didn't think too much of it. I just got lost in painting and creating different things. And so, um, I sat down with my father and we had like a strong heart to heart during COVID. And he kind of just gave me insight on his story and who he was. And I always mm. had this like kind of disconnected relationship with my father. And, but once he started telling me, I just like, I man, I just empathized with him and I just saw him so differently. And then, so it healed our relationship. And then a few weeks later, like this whole vision, and I know this is going to sound like water to some people, but this whole like, vision got kind of like downloaded into me. Like I saw this entire project just kind of like play out like a movie and like, mm. like it was so wild and I saw it and I heard the name and it was like everything and I, and I got it. And I was just like, and I knew in my gut in that moment, it was like, oh, it's time for like a switch up in my career. Like I'm about to like completely pivot, pivot and I'm about to leverage everything that I've done up until this point to support this vision like it's like nice. all chips on the table like we're going in yeah all in and so that's what i did i started like restructuring myself even creatively because american passport it's land of painting poetry film music um and technology it's a mix of everything it's a completely immersive latino immigrant experience um and so it hasn't necessarily been done before and so there's so many things i've been learning but like this is why i love like I'm such a faith driven person. I don't focus on like what I'm afraid of or what I don't have or the doubts. I focus on like what I have access to and like what can be brought and like solutions. And so like I just started piecing whatever puzzles I did have to like bring it together and slowly but surely like it's it's underway. It's in the making. And I'm so excited because it was like I didn't do this for anything other than because I love what it stands for. It's yeah. storytelling. And like, for me, storytelling is the best way to understand people. It's like, just take a moment to like, listen to their stories and you'll realize that we're so much more connected than we even like take a moment to appreciate. And so, and also like, our people have such crazy ass stories. Like there's yeah. so many like wild Latino immigrant like moments. Right. And I just like, I want to mm -hmm. like bring light to that and also like repaint the narrative of the way Latinos are viewed in this country. Um, yeah. we're not what they say. We're a lot of heroes in disguise. So like, I want to bring that to, you know, people's forefront and start changing that narrative in, in a creative, beautiful, impactful, collaborative way. Cause it's not just me as an artist working, right. I'm working with other Latino artists to start forming this kind of ecosystem of creatives mm -hmm. so we can start leaning on each other. So explain to the audience and what, what they can expect to see and kind of experience so forth. So there's, there's a component of storytelling. There's a component mm -hmm. of art artistry. There's a component of technology. Tell me how, how it works. Um, so it's going to be an immersive experience. So just imagine like what you normally do. And I can't, honestly, I'm not even like, I, there's certain things I can't really say right now because we're still like working quietly on certain yeah. things, but I would say the first thing, and this is just the top tier, we're learning real people into works of art. So we're going to ha start having like little community call outs where we invite some of the Latinos in Miami to share their stories. And then we're going to take those stories and we're going to photograph you, film you, collect the audio, and we're going to transform that into something more cinematic. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to bring in my kind of fine art hand and also do some oil paintings of some of those specific people so that eventually what you're going to have at the end is this like immersive museum experience where like people of my ending will actually be the work itself. yeah the work itself and so and then we're going to do something with those stories that will be phase two but that's phase one wow that is awesome that and so when when do you think that will come about september 
Hispanic, this September? Hispanic Heritage Month. Oh, wow. And I can't say where yet, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that's a lot of work. That's We've already work. started. We've been working. Okay, cool. We've been working. Yeah, yeah, you're not listen, starting I'm that not, now. I'm not behind <laughs> the game now. No, I've been practicing. So. Yeah, yeah. No, we're all set. So we're, we're just moving our feet. That's fantastic. Well, Alejandro, you have a, a fantastic story. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this and, and be sure to uh, to follow her on the artist Alejandro, uh, right? Mm -hmm. On mm -hmm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Where else can companies and, and other people reach out to you? What's uh, the best I'm way? My website, just the Instagram will link you right to my website and it's theartistalejandro.com. Guys, if you loved it, what you saw here, make sure to share it and like and subscribe mm -hmm. to Game Changers. Uh, we bring you folks that are just incredible, incredible storytellers here, just like Alejandra. So again, thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. If you loved what you heard in today's episode of Game Changers, please subscribe and rate us. The lessons and the stories in these podcasts are immensely valuable. So I invite you to share them with a friend who needs to hear it. You may end up being the game changer in their lives.